Okay, so I think, um, yeah. Good morning, everyone. We have started recording now. Okay, so I just want to uh, do a quick recap. So we, in the last lecture, we discussed what an M alternating path is, and in particular, what an M augmenting path is, right? So an M augmenting path is an M alternating path such that both the ends S and T, if those are the ends, are M exposed. Okay. In particular, those two vertices S and T are not matched. And uh, we looked at an example. This example was not uh, particularly good as I realize now, uh, because in this example, the augmenting path spans, contains all the vertices. So it could be a bit misleading. Um, it might give you the impression that you need to contain all the vertices, which is not true. So I want to do a more complete example today. Whenever you have an M augmenting path, you just take the symmetric difference of the current matching with this path, and you will get a matching whose cardinality is exactly one more than the previous matching. That was this observation that you were supposed to uh, prove yourself. It's fairly easy. Uh, sir, I had yeah. one question regarding this one. Yeah. Uh, you said that we can use this technique to uh, increase the size of the matching. Right. But what if we have we what if what if what about the base case that we have no matching at all? So the right. first uh, edge we need to find. Good point. Okay. So I'll address that too in this example. Okay. So here is the example that I constructed for the sake of this discussion. So supposing you were to start with the empty matching, right? So generally, if you want to find a maximum matching or a maximum anything, you could find, you could start with the empty set, right? So let's say your first matching M0 is empty. Okay. Now, can you tell me, is there an M augmenting path here? So that was my question actually. So how do we find the augmenting path if because augmenting path requires that we have that alternating covered, non-covered right. uh, edges, but Good. we don't know any matching, so we cannot find that covered or uncovered edges. Um yes and no. A single edge here is an M augmenting path. It's a one edge, so alternating just means that it could be anything, and both the ends are exposed. So in this example. I could think of a single edge as an M augmenting path. It fits the definition. It's just a one edge path. The alternate edges belong to M and do not belong to M. Right? Because it's only one edge and both the ends are exposed. Do you agree? So I'm going to consider this as my path P0. And my first matching M1 is going to be M0 symmetric difference P0, which is simply going to be one edge, 0, 4. Is that fine? OK, so that means we can start with any random edge and it can be That's one, right. one of the. Exactly, okay. exactly. Now, can you find me another M augmenting path here, which is again like a trivial path? You can think of this as a very trivial M augmenting path. So can you give me another M augmenting path, which is trivial? By trivial, I mean it's a one length path. It has just one edge. Eight, nine. Eight, nine. OK. So let me choose P1 as a single edge, eight, nine. That's a single edge path. So until now, the example is not very interesting. Now I'll start creating uh, multiple copies of the graph. Okay, and now I get M2 is M1 symmetric difference P1, which is simply 0, 4, 8, 9. Okay, so I have a bigger matching. Now I have two edges. Okay, good. Uh, great. So now maybe let me create a copy of this. Um, yeah, so I don't have a 
mouse pad. Let me see. Okay, good. Not bad. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, go slightly further down here. And all right. So now the current matching is um, M2 0489. Now, can you give me one more M augmenting path, uh, M2 augment augmenting path now? It could be trivial, it could be non trivial, whatever. We can have six, seven, six, seven. Great. So just a single edge again. So in that case, let me just go back to this example uh, and include six, seven. So P2 is going to be six, seven and M3 is M2 symmetric difference P2. And I have zero, four, eight, nine and six, seven until now the symmetric difference operation is all is the same as the union operation because the two sets are always disjoint okay so now we have this matching and now is there an m augmenting path this is where the example actually becomes interesting Yes, sir. We can yes. start from five, uh, okay. five, nine, five, nine, uh, nine, eight, eight, nine. four. Okay. And zero, one, okay. seven. Uh, oh, no, you, zero, yeah. one. Zero, one. Okay. So you want to start at uh, five and end at one. And this is your path. You go from, let's see. Yeah. Five to nine, nine to eight, eight to four, four to zero and zero to one. Is this your path? Yes. Sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Anshika. Okay, so now this is going to be our path. And uh, let me write it down. P. This is going to be so okay, so this is not m2 anymore. This is m3 0 4 8 9 and 6 7. And the m3 augmenting path p3. It's we are going to, I'm going to write it down as a sequence of edges, but we also can think of it as a set of edges, right? So five, nine, nine, eight, eight, four, four, zero, and zero, one. Okay. And if you take the symmetric difference of these two, M4 is M3 symmetric difference P3. Well, you can take the set difference or you can think of it visually. Visually, what are we doing? We are keeping all the edges that were already there and not in this path. And on this path, we are switching. So instead of eight, nine, we are going to take five, nine and four, eight. Instead of zero, four, we are going to take zero, one. Right. And so we have six, seven, which was already there. And on this path, we are switching five, nine, four, eight and zero, one. And if you were to do the symmetric difference set theoretically, you will get the exact same answer. Right? Okay. So that's a matching of size four. So let's, uh, let's create that matching here. Okay. So let me erase this one and let me erase this one. And the new matching is five, nine, four, eight, um, zero, one and six, seven. This is our matching M four and it has four edges, right? We started with zero edges M zero, and now we have four edges in our matching. Are there any more M augmenting paths? Can anybody find any more M augmenting paths? If you can't find it, can you convince me 
that there is no end augmenting path. So I don't think there should be any other because if we find one more, this matching M5 will have five and that will, okay, we might find, okay. I, but I'm not finding I think anything. So. Okay, okay, Anshika. I think, sir, there is an augmenting path. We can start from three because three and okay. two both are free, sir. Okay, three, great. zero, Let's start and two. from three. Ah, three, right. Three, zero, zero, two. Three, zero, and two. Okay, let's look at this. Yes. Three, zero, and zero, two. Uh, Madhav Mittal, you have raised your hand. I'll get back to you in a minute after addressing this one. So, three, zero, zero, two. Is this an M augmenting path? If you look it at the it can't be an augmenting, but um, it has no, to be no, odd. Sir, and... No, sir. Yes, sir. right. No, sir. Exactly. It is not an good. Augmenting. Okay, good, good. So it's a good point. So it looks like an augmenting path. It starts, it ends at M uh, exposed vertices, but it is actually not alternating. It is not an alternating because both there are only two edges. In particular, an M augmenting path will have a, uh, have an odd number of edges, and those odd number of edges will have to alternate. Uh, being in M and not being in M, right? So if you start with a non-M edge, the next edge has to be an M edge, right? So this is not an M augmenting path. M4 augmenting path. Is everybody clear with this? Is everybody convinced that 3002 is not an M augmenting, M4 augmenting path. Okay, so is there an M4 augmenting path in this example? Um, sir, no. Okay, and can you give a short explanation as to why uh, this is true? Like, if there were one, there would be a match. There would, like, with the help of an with the help of the augmenting path, you would be able to create a five-sized matching. Okay. And since the five-sized matching would require at least ten vertices, so oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. So, so the vertices, there are no yeah. more exposed yeah. vertices anymore. Well, there are exposed vertices two and three. But but they they do not form anything. So I mean, viable exposed vertices they are not available. <laughs> right. Okay. And how would you convince me briefly about that using some simple graph theoretical argument in this example? Supposing you have to start at one of them, right? Let's start at two. So if you start at two, why can you not get to three using an M augmenting path? The number of edges are even for us. That is a big rule out. Right, the particular path we are looking at is any even number of uh, uh, edges, but there are other paths, right? Or are there no other paths? But or they are the only cycles. Path? Uh, right. In fact, this is the only path. The others are not paths. They are walks or uh, whatever you call them, right? Cycles. But they are not paths because in a path you cannot repeat vertices. Yeah. From two, you have to go to zero, and if you go don't go to three, you will have to go somewhere else. And eventually you'll have to come back to zero in order to go to three. And that's yes. only path. Hmm. Right? Good. Exactly. So there is no M M4 augmenting path. And there is a simple reason here, which is that you just cannot find an M augmenting path between two and three because of the argument we discussed. Great. Does that mean that this is a maximum matching? The answer is yes, and that requires a proof. And you will be proving that on assignment one. Okay. So that is called Berge's lemma. It's an easy uh, lemma to prove once you know the way to uh, approach it. Once you figure out the way to approach it. So Berge's lemma is from 1957. Although um, it seems that it was already known to Peterson, uh, namesake the famous Peterson graph, in 1891 and Koenig in 1931. However, the result uh, is generally known as Berge's lemma because Berge is one of the people who made the best use of it. Um, so he claimed that he proved that 
whenever the matching is not maximum it is precisely because there exists an m augmenting path right the other direction is easy you already proved it in your do it yourself if there is an m augmenting path then the matching cannot be maximum right so this is easy and it was a do it yourself problem in the last lecture and this is on assignment one, which will be announced on this weekend. I wanted to announce it by Friday, but because of the um, COVID issue we are facing, I don't think I'll be able to do that. Okay. And this is great news because in some sense, this is telling you that there is an algorithm, there could be an algorithm, hopefully an efficient algorithm, to find the maximum matching, right? And that algorithm is exactly what we did. You start with the empty set and until you are able to find an augmenting path, you keep augmenting your matching with that path until there exists an M augmenting path. You run the following loop. You find an M augmenting path. You know it exists uh, if the matching is not maximum. And you update your matching by taking the symmetric difference of the current matching with the path P, viewing the path as a set of edges. Okay, and that's it. And once you, once there is no M augmenting path, you return your matching. It has to be maximum because of Berge's lemma. Okay, so that's an algorithm. What's the problem with this algorithm at this point? I mean, is this a polynomial time algorithm at this point in time? Or what do we need to do in order to make it a polynomial time algorithm? So what is the main thing that we need to figure out in order to get a polynomial term Each iteration we need to be able to find an amount. Exactly, part. exactly. So this is what we need to figure out. Can this be done in polynomial time? Right? Uh, we won't be answering this question in this module. I'll tell you the answer is yes. Um, and basically, all algorithms for finding a maximum matching are based on this idea. Even if you use flows, essentially you are finding augmenting paths uh, inside the theory of network flows, if you have seen network flows. But if you haven't seen network flows, don't worry about it. Um, basically, all of the algorithms for matchings use the idea uh, from Verge's lemma, that there is always an augmenting path. You can find this path and augment. Uh, the only thing you need is you need an efficient way to find M augmenting paths. And, uh, right, so we need an efficient way to discover M augmenting paths.
And in the bipartite case, this is actually quite easy. We will see that in module four. And bipartite case can also be done using network flows, as you may have seen in uh, previous courses. If not, it doesn't matter. For the non-bipartite case, that I may also call the general case, uh, Edmonds gave an algorithm in 19... 61, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Was it 1965? Yeah, 1965. It's called the Edmonds Blossom algorithm. And we will also be seeing this in module four. Okay. I'm um, hoping that not all of you would have seen this in your previous courses. Generally, the bipartite case is covered in many courses but the non bipartite case is often not covered. And uh, once we, so we will probably focus on perfect matchings, but the same can be done for maximum matchings. And that might be on one of your assignments. And once we are able to find maximum matchings or perfect matchings, then we will go on to look at minimum cost perfect matchings uh, in module four. And that is where we will use the theory of linear programming for just finding a maximum or a perfect matching. We don't need linear programming theory. We are going to use combinatorial, uh, also known as graph theoretical techniques. Okay. Good. But uh, many of the ideas that are used in solving the maximum matching and perfect matching problems, um, many of those ideas and many of those concepts will also appear when we are looking at uh, graphs with costs and we are trying to find perfect matching with minimum cost. Okay, so that's another reason to cover the combinatorial side of it as well. Okay, so are there any questions or concerns at this point? Uh, sir, what do you mean by combinatorial, combinatorial techniques? Uh, are they related to graphs or something else? Yeah, combinatorial for this course is basically graph theoretical or counting kind of arguments. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So if there are no questions regarding all of this, let's switch to a new page. So we have been talking about finding augmenting paths. Let's talk about something easier, finding paths. Okay, and that's another problem that we'll be looking at uh, through the lens of uh, linear programming duality in module four. So let's talk about that problem. Okay. <clears throat> So how do you find a path between two vertices in a graph? Anyone? You must have seen this in your previous courses. How do you find whether two vertices S and T uh, are connected by a path? BFS? Sure. You can do BFS or DFS and you will always find a path between the two vertices. Right? Okay. So finding path. You can use BFS or DFS or any graph searching technique, graph traversal technique. Okay. Um, we are going to be interested in something uh, slightly different. We are going to be interested in finding shortest paths. And there are at least two variants of it. So Okay, so let's just look at an example. <clears throat> okay, let's say zero, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. 
Okay, and let's say I want to find a path between uh, two vertices S and T. Okay, so well, we all know what a path is. It's just a sequence of edges that will lead us from S to T. And we don't want to repeat any vertex. And therefore, we can also not repeat edges. Um, so one possibility is the cardinality case, which basically means that we want a shortest path using as few edges as possible. Right, so use as few edges as possible. And then there's the other case, which is the cost case, cost case or the weighted case. In this case, you will have costs given to the edges. We will assume the costs to be non-negative. Okay, so we have we have a cost function from the edge set of the graph to non-negative real numbers. So let's say R plus union zero. Or maybe let me just use a simpler notation. Uh, okay. And what we want to do is we want to find a path from S to T that has minimum cost and the cost of the path will be equal to be the sum of the cost of its edges, right? Um, minimize cost of the path. Okay. And we will in particular focus on finding a shortest ST path where S and T are given to us. S and T are distinct vertices of the graph. Okay. Um, so the way I see it is this is an easier problem when it comes to devising an algorithm and it will be a good way to see how primal dual algorithms work when we get to module four. Chances are that you have already seen algorithms for shortest path in your previous courses. You might have seen Dijkstra or Bellman Ford or something like that. Uh, we will look at an algorithm that is based on linear programming theory, right? Uh, in particular, the cost case will be more interesting, but for today, let us just think about the cardinality case, right? Let's get started with the easier case. Uh, cardinality case is the same as assuming that the cost of each edge is equal to one right this is the same as this assumption okay. so if you are going to talk about paths we need to talk about another concept called cuts so i want to focus for the rest of the lecture on talking about cuts Okay. Paths are related to cuts. All right. So we will come to the relation uh, soon between paths and cuts. So first of all, what is a cut in a graph? So here is the idea. you have the set of vertices so g is your graph what you want to do is you want to partition the vertex set into two parts so this is your set of vertices let's partition it into two parts x and x bar Actually, you know what? Uh, yeah, that should be fine. Let me just use a different uh, symbol because let's call this Z. Okay. 
Okay. And what we want to do is we want to look at all the edges that have one end in Z and the other end in Z bar. And this is going to be called a cut of the graph, right? So what is a cut? Uh, a cut is a set of edges. We will denote it by partial of Z. And you will see why we are choosing this notation. Maybe you already see it. It is a set of edges, partial of Z, uh, that arises from a bipartition of the vertex set. Bipartition means it has two parts. Uh, let's say Z and Z bar. Okay. And in particular, it is defined as follows. It is exactly the set of edges such that U belongs to Z and V belongs to Z bar. Or U is in Z bar and V is in Z. Right? U and V is just uh, arbitrary choice. Okay, so let's look at an example. Supposing we go back to our graph here. So what you can do is you can consider any set of vertices Z and look at the cut corresponding to that set. Right? So let's say I color the vertices of Z uh, using red color. Let's say these are my Z vertices. Can someone tell me what partial of Z is? What are the edges in partial of Z? Or what are the edges? Yeah, go ahead, Harsha. Yeah, uh, you mean all the edges uh, which are uh, incident on these vertices, right? Right. Only one end is incident on these vertices. No, not both ends. Okay, yeah. Uh, right. It will be 1, 2. 1, 2. 1, 4. 1, 4. Uh, 3, 2, 3, 6, 3, 9. 3, 2, 3, 6, 3, 9. 4, 7, 7, 8. 4, 7, and 7, 8. Okay, let's see. So we have 1, 2, 1, to 4, 3, to 2, 3, to 6, 3, to 9, 4, to 7, and 7, to 8. Okay. Does everybody agree? Are we missing anything? Right. So we are we have marked all the edges that have exactly one end in Z and the other end is not in Z. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. All right. And can anyone tell me what happens if my Z is a single vertex? What are we really looking at in that case? Degree. Uh, can you repeat that? So, uh, I will get the degree, degree of the vertex. Uh, the cardinality will be the degree, but um, in particular, it is all the edges incident at that vertex, right? Yeah, right. Which is how we defined it actually. So if you look at the single vertex set, it is exactly partial of V as we have already defined it when we talked about matchings, right? Remember that for any vertex V, partial V is exactly the set of edges incident at that vertex. Okay. Okay, so that's the reason we are using the same notation because it's the same idea, uh, but instead of a single vertex, 
we are looking at a whole set of vertices. So I want to give you uh, two problems related to cuts. Um, these are going to be slightly vague, but I want you to think about them and solve them on your own. So they are do-it-yourself problems. So you all know what a bipartite graph is. I want you to think of a bipartite graph in terms of the cuts of the graph. So I'll say characterize. bipartite graphs in terms of cuts. What I mean is um, something like the following. Um, and I'm deliberately keeping it vague because I really want you to think about it. I want you to come up with a statement as the following. A graph G is bipartite if and only if uh, some property about the cuts. Okay. So we'll put this as a do it yourself problem. And uh, in one or two lectures, we'll uh, put another do it yourself problem where we'll actually tell you what the characterization is. So hopefully you can figure it out on your own. If you can't, then we will change it in a couple of days in a new post. Okay. Good. And uh, there is another problem, but before that we should talk about connected graphs. I assume you all know what a connected graph is. Uh, I have been already using the term uh, in lectures, but I'll just state it for the sake of completeness. So can anyone tell me what a connected graph is using paths? So there exists a path between every two vertices. Right, exactly. A graph G is connected if there exists a path between any two vertices. But maybe let me make it precise between each pair of vertices. Right? There exists a UV path between each pair of vertices U and V. Okay. And what I also want you to do is I want you to do the same problem for connected graphs. So problem two is to characterize connected graphs in terms of cuts. Okay, so exactly the same kind of statement. A graph G is connected if and only if some property about the cuts. Okay, so please try these on your own. Good. So one thing I want to emphasize on again is uh, it's a very standard misconception. A cut is a set of edges. It is not a set of vertices. However, it arises from a partition of the vertex set, in particular, a bipartition of the vertex set. OK, so this is something that is a fairly common misconception. Um, students often think that it is a set of vertices. Uh, and so on. Okay, so it's a set of edges, but it arises from a bipartition of the vertex set. Okay. So why do we care about cuts in the context of ST paths? Can anyone comment on this if you already see it? Okay, if not, let me point at this example again. Here we considered a set of vertices 
we have colored them in red. This is the set Z. And in particular, in our example, I deliberately chose it so that S belongs to Z. However, T, the other vertex that we are interested in, does not belong to Z. In other words, it belongs to the complement of Z. We are going to call this an ST cut. Okay, because one vertex is in the set Z and the other vertex is in the set Z complement. So we'll call this this set of edges, we will call it an ST cut. So what can you say about ST cuts and ST paths? If I give you any ST path, and if I give you any ST cut, what can you say about them? So there'll be some common edge between both of them. Exactly. Every ST path, yes, their intersection will always be non-empty. Every ST path meets every ST cut. Okay. So let's write down a cut partial Z of a graph G is an ST cut, right? So what is the setup here? G is a graph and S and T are two distinct vertices of your graph, right? So in this case, we will say that a cut is an ST cut if precisely one of S and T belongs to Z, right? And therefore, the other one belongs to Z complement, right? It just follows by the first clause. Okay, so what does an ST cut look like? It looks like a partition of the vertex set where S is on one side and T is on the other side. And you are looking at all the edges going from the left side to the right side. Right? So this set of edges will be called an ST cut. And the key observation is that if you take any ST path, it will have to meet every ST cut. Every ST path P meets every ST cut partial of Z, right? What do I mean by meet? If you think of the path as a set of edges and the cut is a set of edges, then this intersection has to be non-empty. Can anyone explain why this is true? I mean, it seems a bit obvious, but I would like to hear a brief explanation of why this is true. Why can't I have an ST path which is completely contained on the left side? So all the edges have both ends in Z. But even at one point, uh, they should cross ST, right? Then it uh, should go across Z and Z. Even in the exactly. exactly. You are going from S, which is in Z, to T, which is in Z bar. So at some point, you must leave the set Z 
in order to enter the set Z bar, right? This has to happen at some point. It has to happen at at least one point. Can you make a stronger statement than this? So can we say something stronger than this? So here we are saying that P intersection partial of Z is non-empty. Can you say something stronger than this? about the cardinality of this set. We know it is not zero. It has to be of odd cardinality. Exactly. Because if you just think about this drawing, and you can write a formal proof about this, this is something that you should probably try on your own. Maybe I'll make it a do-it-yourself problem. So if you start at the set S, right? if, you, if at any point you use an edge of this uh, cut, you will go to Z bar, right? And then if you again use an edge in the cut, you will again be in Z. But then you again need to go into Z bar because your last vertex is in Z bar. So the intersection has to be an odd number of times. Each time you use an edge of the cut, you will go from Z to Z bar. Right? And then you'll again go from Z bar to Z. So in this particular proof, you might want to think of your path as a sequence of edges rather than just a set of edges. So the particular viewpoint you use depends on what you're trying to prove or what you're trying to visualize. Right? OK, so this will be a do-it-yourself problem. Prove that the intersection of any ST path and any ST cut is odd. In particular, it has to be at least one. OK, great. So all right. So here is a question I want to end with today. Um, so we are going to be interested in shortest ST paths. And today, I want to look at the cardinality case. I'm just going to point out a particular question that I want you to think about. So let's say. In a specific example, I give you, so maybe I'll state it as a decision problem because we have already been doing this. So consider the decision problem. Shortest path. And this is the cardinality version. Okay, so what is the problem? You are given a graph G and distinct vertices S and T and an ST path P. Your goal is to decide whether P is a shortest path. Okay, so there are two instances, the yes instances where it is a shortest path and no instances. Which one is easy to convince? Huh? Can you convince someone easily that a path is shortest or can you more easily convince someone that a path is not a shortest path? Not shortest is easy. Thank you, Ravi. Right, so this is easy. So the problem is in co NP uh, because you just give a shorter path and that will be your certificate. So what I want you to think about is how will you convince someone that a path is actually, a given ST path is actually a shortest path. So this is your try it yourself problem. And we will discuss the way to do it tomorrow. But I would really suggest that you think about it before our meeting. So can you think of 
some certificate uh, to convince uh, maybe let me just use the usual terms right can you think of some NP certificate for this problem okay so given a shortest path or given an ST path P you want to convince your friend that this is actually a shortest ST path and I will give you a hint Think in terms of ST cuts. Okay. What I mean is your certificate is actually going to be a collection of ST cuts. I'll just leave it at that point. Okay. Uh, and you might want to consider this example to um, drive your intuition. But I mean, there's nothing special about this example. You might want to make more examples and figure out. Okay, so that's all for today. And we will continue from this try it yourself problem tomorrow. But I'm here for another five, 10 minutes if there are any questions or concerns. Is everything clear? Are there any questions? Okay, I'll stop recording, but I'm still here.